Hello, my name is William Bunbury uh, and I'm talking to you about the Lisnavar Timber Project. So we're here at Lisnavar in the north of County Carlow, which is about 600 acres in all. Uh, there would be 200 acres of woodland in amongst that. Uh, a lot of small parcels of woodland, mixed woodland, mainly hardwood, but lots of different species within those woods. Um, there's also at Lisnava we have uh, Lisnava House where we do a number of weddings, uh, yoga retreats, and other events. We have quite a few cottages, um, which are mainly let out through Airbnb, uh, particularly during the pandemic. They were extremely popular. Uh, we obviously do the, some of the farming. We do the tillage farming ourselves. The grass is let out. Uh, that may change a little bit in coming years. Um, but the, on the forestry side of things, um, I came back here to listen about 20 years ago and was trying to think what we do with the timber coming from the woods and whether we can do better than to sell it to a timber merchant. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with timber merchants, but maybe we could make something out of the wood and, and you know sell it for more than we can sell a tree. So we picked up 60 tons of logs that were lying around the place, three lorry loads, brought them to a sawmill in Wicklow uh, and we planked the timber there uh, with someone who knew what they were doing so that was good, it was a good start and I started selling timber to furniture makers. I got it kiln dried in Wicklow, brought it back here and designed a website attached to thisnava.com that sold hardwood timber and it, it, it grew from there. I also uh, designed a, a spreadsheet that became a database that kept track of all the different logs that we uh, had in our sawmilling yard and also more importantly it kept track of all the, the planks of timber. Sorry my dog is digging a hole right beside the camera. <laughs> I don't know if that's interfering with the shots. Um, the, the database kept track of every plank that came out of these logs and uh, we measured the planks, we graded the planks and um, that uh, meant that I knew how many one inch oak planks I had, or two inch beech planks and when they were sawn uh, because they needed to dry and air dry. So I think what I'll probably do next is I might take this camera down to the farmyard where the workshop is in the sawmill area and I'll explain a bit more about what we do down there. Actually, before we go down to the farmyard, I just want to show you in this wood, as I happen to be passing, it's a young beech wood, or fairly young. Um, on the edge of it, we left some trees, including chestnuts. In Storm Barra uh, in December 2021, that chestnut blew down, unfortunately, horse chestnut. So it's not much good for us in terms of timber. Uh, for the timber project, a bit of firewood. It's not great firewood either. The best thing a horse chestnut can do is stay standing, but unfortunately that one didn't. Um, when I was looking at that though, um, I came across this fella, which is uh, an ash tree that came down in the same storm. And that is more interesting. It's a reasonably sizable tree. Um, and it's certainly got some commercial timber in it, as well as clearly a lot of firewood. It's very hard to see underneath all that ivy. There's a colossal amount of ivy on the tree. That may not have helped its chances in a bit of a wind. It acts like a sail, um, and that may be partly why it came down. The number <coughs> you can see there is the log reference for this tree. Um, 21 means 2021, the year, and 08 simply means it's the eighth tree to go onto our database this year. So it's a very simple numbering system. Uh, later on, when we do tree reports and stamp chopping boards with log references, that would actually read 210008. I just wanted to go off topic for a moment because there's more to woods than timber. Uh, there's the amenity value, the aesthetics, the landscape, carbon sequestration, um, and we found recently that we've been sitting on a very useful resource for our yoga retreats. Um, about 20 minutes ago, we just finished one, a silent walk um, through the woods. Eight of our guests came out with Emily and walked for about a bit over an hour, 
uh, most of it, not all of it, in silence. And it's, it's very good for mental health. Um, we've also found it hugely advantageous to um, have these woods as a, as a resource for corporate events. Um, so perhaps a bit of clay pigeon shooting in the morning, followed in the afternoon by a bushcraft course in the woods just up here, for example. So there are many, many things one can do with one's woods beyond just growing timber. House is looking pretty fantastic today. The digger which we use to extract timber from the woods it's giving a, a bit of a clean the grab on the front is just being fixed and um, and we want to get that timber that I just showed you out of the woods as soon as possible this is the timber project so this is where we bring the logs to uh, when they come out of the woods there's not very many around at the moment in fact most of what you can see here has been rejected year after year when we were sawmilling and is probably firewood. There's a little bit of oak at the back there, which is good to go. Um, as before, you can see a, a log reference on the log there, 1803. The 0.3 at the end means it's the third log from that tree. We do the sawmilling under cover over there if it's raining or out in the open if it's a lovely day. Um, we use the digger to load the sawmill with logs. The mobile sawmill is brought here on the back of a Jeep and is up and running within a few minutes of arriving and we go hell for leather for three or four days with everyone we can muster uh, to get oh, 30 40 50 tons depends what we're sawing uh, planked into mainly one and two inch planks the timber is brought in under cover uh, where it is allowed to air dry um, every plank is given a number and uh, its dimensions are recorded it's graded and any quirkiness or features on the plank are noted at the same time. That all then gets entered onto the database. The timber is left to air dry in this shed for a year or two. Basically the rule of thumb is a one inch plank takes a year, a two inch plank takes two years and so on. Air drying brings the moisture content of the timber down to 18-20% in Ireland and that is not good enough for the furniture industry. Uh, who need that timber down to give or take 10%. So we kiln dry it here. We have four kilns, well, two and a half actually for various reasons. But anyway, this is a kiln we're about to set off. I haven't turned the lights on, but I think you'll be able to see. It's a fairly simple kiln. So we've got some two inch oak in here, which has been around for about three years, actually. Um, you can see here uh, a white box, which contains a dehumidifier and a heater. Um, there's a long line of fans go right down the full 26 foot of this kiln to the far end. Uh, there's about six fans plus the heater fan. And that two inch material will probably take four or five weeks, something like that, to bring down to 10%. As long as every sample I take, and I take quite a few, as long as they're all below 12%, and you'll find some are 8%, then I'm fine with that, and that's what comes out of the kiln, and is ready for sale or for making things from. The kiln dried timber is then brought through that big door into this space here, where it is kept um, dry. This is all one inch oak. That's two inch oak. We have ash underneath. Um, here and we have chestnut, Spanish chestnut, just two bits left there. Uh, that's more oak and we have more oak here with the top plank actually being a big piece of sycamore. Uh, here we have some cherry and we have some more sycamore here and sycamore again, beach, a little bit of elm, really not very much, a bit more beach, one inch beach, two inch beach, three and four inch oak pieces there some nice big wide uh, pieces of two inch oak lots of stresses and crack strains in them but they're still attractive to to certain people for for particularly say 
Uh, I'm thinking of a, a cocktail counter, a cocktail bar counter top that was made from one of these and a few other projects. In fact, this one over here is going to uh, WIT as a plaque. Having started the whole timber project in 2001, um, we was just selling timber to furniture makers at that stage. By 2004, I'd built a small workshop. I was able to make basic things like kitchen worktops, um, bookshelves and things like that, uh, tabletops. And that was going okay. Um, it was like William's little hobby on the estate. <laughs> um, by the time we got to 2008, though, we were trying to up our game a bit. And so we decided we'd make... Uh, high-end chopping boards that we would get into shops and sell at a, a good price. Uh, and we came up with the name Bunbury Boards through our marketing person, which made me cringe quite a lot to begin with, but I got used to it. And we got them into places like the Kilkenny shop and so on. Um, and this is the workshop in which uh, they were made. Um, I, I'm, it, I'm slightly cheating because there was actually a different workshop when we first started making them. But this, this we moved into in 2010. It's a substantial building, um, which we put up uh, especially for the timber project uh, for it to expand so into. So a quick run through the process of the timber in this workshop. The first machine it's likely to meet is this 30 inch planar thicknesser made by Wodkin. Um, every plank, as you know, has a number on it and our database knows how big it is. It also knows its cost of production. But as we process each piece of, or each plank rather, the number goes into this book here, it's written down, and at the end of any given month, I can take those numbers, put them into my magic database, and it says that I used 582 euros worth of timber or whatever the figure may be. And it's really important to know that the cost of my timber and the cost of my labor is less than what I've sold everything for. That's really obviously quite important. After the planar thicknesser, uh, we use templates to um, basically draw shapes on each plank of wood, which we're then going to uh, cut the boards out from. We'll probably start with the table saw here uh, to cut, rough it out. We'll probably go over to a band saw then where we may cut curvy corners and so on. We'll use an edge sander, which has just been doing these boards, to, to make sure that the edges are nice and smooth. We then may drill a hole in for a handle or something. Uh, if some boards, in fact, something like this is going to have a hole uh, at the top of it here. So that's what that's for. This is a table sander, which can sand uh, quite a few boards at once. Oh, and there's a router here, which would put a, a rounded, a rounded, edge on some of the boards, not all of them, certain styles. The boards then come over here where they are belt sanded, one of these guys. Um, we then hand sand the edges just to make sure that they're all nice and smooth before giving it a final run with a, a 180 grit orbital sander and then a 240 grit orbital sander. So there you go, you've got all my secrets now. When the boards are finished, they're brought through into here and uh, they're ready for stamping with a log reference and then for oiling. I know uh, what planks went through that planar thickness a couple of days ago. I know what trees were used to make these chopping boards from and I therefore know what log references to write or stamp onto the back of the boards. So we just have a generic stamp first and then the specific number for that tree. That, that's how it looks. So this is it before it's oiled. It's in a, about half an inch of oil here. Run a cloth around it. It's now oiled and ready to drip dry. Now, that's actually an oil that I make myself. Um, I don't use, I used to use Danish oil, um, but people got concerned about not allergies because it's got tongue oil in it which is a nut and there's also naphtha which is another word for white spirits or petrol or something and cobalt heavy metals 
So um, I thought I'd do my own oil, which is basically linseed oil heated up, uh, blended with a couple of things to, uh, which are all natural, like cold, cold pressed orange juice and so on. Just, just draw the oil into the wood, but it doesn't dry as quickly as the, um, say, boiled linseed oil. Uh, it takes longer, but that's good because it means my boards can stay here until um, tomorrow. And I'll wipe them the off oil if there's anything that's, left. Uh, you can see glistening on the side there. That oil is um, basically going into the wood quite slowly, but by tomorrow those boards will be dry. So from 2008 to 2016, we had a fair range of chopping boards in quite a few shops in Ireland, the UK and the States. And it was a marketing success. We were in quite a few shops uh, as I say, and uh, some quite well-known, like Marks and Spencers, John Lewis, Harrods, uh, in Arnold's, Kilkenny shops. Um, so yeah, quite a, quite a range of, of uh, shops. Some some would be more garden centery, and some would be huge department stores, or say William Sonoma in America, which has I think got seven hundred and something shops. So. Uh, it was a marketing success, but uh, I couldn't cover the overheads of our wonderful sales girl in the room down there and production manager in here, uh, bookkeepers, uh, marketing costs, trade shows and so on. And the end result was that I had to stop trying to conquer the world with chopping boards and we just restricted it to an online shop. So our main sales streams for the timber are the raw timber going to furniture makers, the uh, commissioned items, for example, that plaque, but we've also got two worktops. A lot of people looking for kitchen worktops as it happens this month. I don't know why, it's January, so maybe that's why. Um, and then of course, there's the Bunbury boards. Um, since 2016, when I pulled out of the major retailers and reduced my overhead significantly, um, the struggling business that it had been uh, became a profitable hobby with a pretty steady income in 2017, 18 and 19. Interestingly in 2020 our sales then went up 25 percent. Now that might be because I had more time for this business uh, as opposed to getting involved in lots of weddings up at the house and so on because they'd all been cancelled. Um, but Things did pick up in 2021 in that respect, and yet my sales in 2021 went up another 40% on 2020. So the, there's definitely an increase in demand um, there, for local produce. Uh, anything that's locally made and not just designed locally, but made locally uh, and from Irish materials, I, I think there's a market for them. So. I think 2022 is, is getting off to a pretty good start. We're only halfway through the first month, but uh, the indications are that we're, we're on a good upward curve with this business. And I would hope that the same might apply to anyone else who's getting involved in anything similar in Ireland. Okay, I think that's me done. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for listening and good luck to all of you. Cheers. Bye-bye.